Okay, welcome to Simply Psych EDU. Uh, this is the second part of the ADHD in Adults series. Today we're talking about the neuroscience of ADHD and uh, you know, answering the question or attempting to answer the question, uh, what do we know about the neurobiology of ADHD? This is a very, oh, this is a very general overview. This is not a detailed uh, you know, neuroanatomy or, or neurobiology lecture, but I think this will give you a basic understanding of um, the uh, neurobio of attention and what we think uh, may be going wrong in individuals um, who um, suffer from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Unfortunately, I uh, have nothing to disclose financially, so I do not get any money for doing these talks. Uh, medical legal disclosures, uh, the information provided in this presentation is for educational purposes only. Uh, the information provided in this talk is for educational purposes um, and should not be uh, perceived as professional medical advice from the presenter. The information provided in this presentation should not replace the medical advice of your physician. I am not a child adolescent trained psychiatrist. Uh, the opinions um, of the presenter, me, are my own and do not reflect the opinions of any institution. And um, the case, which we won't discuss today, but we introduced in the first lecture and we will talk about uh, toward the end, um, uh, LB, uh, this particular case, uh, the patient was very um, excited that we were going to discuss her case because she uh, really benefited from treatment and uh, wanted to share her positive response. Some of the diagrams, um, some of the diagrams from this talk uh, come from various textbooks. Three of them um, are listed here. That's me. Learning objectives. Um, these are for you to review. I'm not going to go over all of them, but I just put them here, and I'll keep putting them there um, during uh, at the beginning of every lecture. Okay, so we're going to start with the neurobiology of attention. Okay, so what is attention? So attention is a cognitive function, and cognition uh, can be conceptualized uh, in a number of different ways, but I think the way that uh, makes the most sense and sort of is the, sort of is the most um, accepted is that, is that cognition is a, um, an individual's ability to one, attend to external or internal stimuli, two, identify the significance of the stimuli, and then three, uh, to respond appropriately. So attention really describes the mechanism that weighs the importance of these various stimuli and then selects the one that will receive uh, the brain's focus. And we think of it as sort of a, a component of our level of consciousness, and I think that uh, you know, this may be a little outdated, but you know, when we think of consciousness, there's, there's, many, there, there's many different ways to think of consciousness. Um, there are evolving models to think of consciousness, but I think the one that, um, that I think makes the most sense um, and may not be the most accurate, but actually just helps me can, you know, understand this stuff, is that consciousness really can be broken down into two things, uh, or two parts. So one, you know, our, our level of consciousness, basically our, um, you know, how alert, attentive um, and aware we are, and then the content of our consciousness, which is really the substrates that together make up our consciousness, like emotions, language, memory, motor planning, executive functioning. So we think of um, as attention as more of, of, of a part of our level of consciousness, whatever that means, um, but um, the two major functions of attention, now there are many functions, okay, but the two major ones that, I, that I'm talking about today our uh, selective and, and directed attention, <clears throat> which involves uh, focusing attention on a particular domain um, above others, which can be demonstrated by the Stroop task, which I'll show you in a second. And that selective directed attention um, is really, uh, it involves many regions of the brain, um, but um, primarily what I wanted to point out is that the selective directed attention uh, involves primarily the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, and that's something that I'll show you in a second. Now, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing, 
uh, that's involved. Uh, remember that the brain is highly interconnected. Uh, when we think of these different regions, we don't think of them as isolated regions that do one or other things. It's more uh, how are these regions functionally connected to one another in circuits, and how um, you know how uh, do they interact in a way that uh, allows whatever you know whatever it is that you know whatever function that we need, whether it be directed attention or sustained attention. Um, it's just basically these uh, these connections. Uh, between these different parts uh, that ultimately determine, you know, our ability to do things um, at, at a sort of cognitive level. So the directive, uh, the selective directed attention is, is best illustrated by the Stroop task. Um, there are many other ways you can demonstrate selective or a directed attention. Stroop task is just one of them. Um, and then the second major uh, function is the sustained attention. And that's really you know, um, your ability to sort of uh, maintain concentration on a particular task. And that's best um, illustrated by the end back test. There are many different ways, again, to illustrate sustained attention. But uh, a sustained attention primarily involves uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but also, uh, and, it's, and, and, and its connections essentially to, to the various regions of the brain particularly the, uh, the parietal lobe. Remember that the parietal and the frontal lobe are, are highly interconnected, um, as well as uh, subcortical structures, uh, for example, the basal ganglia and the striatum, and then the uh, brainstem. So there are many different connections that are going on here, but I'm just pointing these major regions out, not because I'm saying that they're the only re region that's involved, but um, when we think of uh, dysfunction uh, in, in, um, or we think of lesions in neurologic patients in these various areas, uh, we primarily see uh, dysfunction in either the selective or directed attention or sustained attention. Uh, but again, that's, that's a very oversimplified way of looking at the brain, but it's a, it's a way to sort of understand it. So this slide is just showing you the neuroanatomy, basic neuroanatomy. Uh, of what's going on here. And you can see that um, there's the uh, prefrontal cortex here, right? And the prefrontal cortex um, it can be divided into, into different regions. And the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex actually is on the other side. So if you can imagine going to the other side over there um, of the brain because this brain is cut in half. If you go to the other side or the right side, if you will, if you're, if you're uh, if you can you see what I'm saying here, that on the other side is the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, that is primarily involved in sustained attention, and then the dorsal anterior cingulate, this is the anterior cingulate right here. The dorsal part of the anterior cingulate um, is involved in directed attention. And then, of course, I put in the, the striatum or the basal ganglia, um, which is a, you know, the caudate and the butame in this area right here is also uh, highly connected to those regions as well. So um, I just wanted to show you this diagram so you had an idea of what brain regions are primarily involved um, in uh, attention. And then uh, the last thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, you can't forget that the parietal lobe uh, is huge uh, when it comes to attentive tasks. And although I don't point it out here, the parietal lobe really is um, on the lateral side, and it's, and it's sort of uh, in this this area here, but it's on the lateral side, so it's on the other side um, of the brain. And so uh, remember that the frontal and the parietal uh, lobes are very important in uh, attentive tasks. So the Stroop tasks um, is uh, is a way of sh of showing. Uh, or demonstrating selective directive attention, and again, that's not—it's—it's it's not a highly specific test, um, but I would say that it—it uh, it does a fairly good job of um, of testing someone's uh, selective or directed attention. And basically, what the Stroop task is is the subjects are subjects are shown words of various colors but not necessarily in the color the word describes. So for example, the word pink would be shown in green and subjects would have to correctly state that the color of the word um, was um, uh, green without stating you know, the actual word pink. And so uh, it takes a little longer to do this than just sort of stating the, squ the squares of the colors or, or just stating what the words are. 
And so um, I'm going to show you sort of how this works. So basically, you know, every time you see uh, a word flash on the on the screen, I just want you to tell me what the color is. So if this one's red. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Green. Okay, so that's pretty quick, right? You kind of get it really quick. Blue. Okay, again, it's pretty simple, right? So for a second, when you see this, um, you see yellow, and the first thing you do is you want to say yellow, but then you stop yourself and you're like, oh wait a minute, that's purple. Um, and so this sort of uh, this sort of um, the discrepancy uh, between the actual color of the word and the word itself uh, requires um, more uh, attempt, you know, more uh, neural resources, if you will, to be able to identify correctly. Uh, what the color is. And so uh, in patients who have problems with attention, uh, they may impulsively state uh, the wrong color, or uh, they may um, may take longer to sort of process what color is that. And the delay, the delay time may be actually longer. So sustained attention uh, includes functions such as vigilance and concentration, uh, non-distractability, and in the end back test, uh, the subject is presented with a sequence of stimuli, and the task consists of indicating when the current stimulus matches the one from n steps earlier in the sequence. So n just means the number of steps back uh, the subject has to remember and can be adjusted to make the task more or less difficult. So uh, the concept is something similar to a game of memory. And um, so you, what you can see here is if you're given uh, you know, N of two tests, and the example is this sequence starting with A, um, and, you're, and, I'm, and I'm going through this sequence, I, I'm asking you to identify when uh, that letter is shown on the screen. Uh, you have to identify when does that stimulus that you're currently seeing match one that was two back before it. So for example, the B here would be one that you'd have to identify because two back was also B. And then A you'd have to identify because two back was A and so forth. And so that requires um, uh, you know, mental effort obviously and uh, is a fairly good uh, way to test sustained attention. Although there are many other ways to test sustained attention and I'm not even sure uh, what they're doing currently. This may be very outdated um, but, you know, this is one way that you can test for sustained attention. And pa patients who have neurocognitive disorders, um, particularly patients uh, with schizophrenia or uh, attention deficit disorder or uh, dementia, they have a very hard time with this particular task. Okay, so back to what is attention. So it's important to know that the capacity to concentrate and maintain one's attention correlates with the ability to ignore extraneous stimuli. In other words, you know, your ability to concentrate or to attend to something really requires uh, many things, but two of the things that, that it requires, one, uh, your ability to sort of direct your attention to uh, whatever, you know, stimulus is going on that you need to attend to, uh, but also your ability to filter out the extraneous stimuli that are sort of competing for your attention. And so these two things sort of uh, need to be happening in order for you to, to attend to something. And the continuous performance tests, which give an objective estimate of an individual's attention and pulsivity, are given um, to people to sort of test their ability to, um, to do these things. And so what we call these CPTs, uh, what they are is basically subjects uh, watch a computer screen and hit a button or click a mouse whenever a specified sequence of symbols or letters appears. And the CPTs reflect the subject's capacity to attend, as well as uh, the ability to restrain impulsive answers. And the results um, are compared with normal, uh, normative data for individuals in one's age group. And these tests, um, there's many of them, and these particular uh, neuropsych tests are often uh, administered to patients who are uh, you know, either um, at, uh, who have um, or are suspected of having attention deficit disorder or uh, other neurocognitive disorders that in fact that they, uh, affect um, your ability to attend to, to, to stimuli. And so 
what's important to know about the CPTs is that when, when we send somebody for a CPT, we're not sending them, you shouldn't send them um, as a way to diagnose ADHD. Um, it's not sensitive, these tests aren't sensitive or specific enough to justify its use as a diagnostic um, tool. Uh, in, in other words, when, when I'm sending somebody, if I, if I do end up sending somebody for a, for a test, is to confirm what I already know clinically based on my diagnostic evaluation, because at the end of the day, ADHD is not a diagnosis based on neuropsych testing, it's a diagnosis based on clinical presentation. And the CPT, what it can do is confirm what you sort of already know. Now, just because the test is negative doesn't automatically mean that they don't have it. And so that's something very important. Um, oftentimes they'll be like, well, I'm not gonna even assess you, I'm just gonna send you for testing. Well, you may miss 30% of patients. And so that's why I think it's important to know that. All right, so you can see here uh, on, the, on the left in, in this figure A, by the way, these uh, diagrams are taken from the Neuroscience of Clinical Psychiatry, which is a wonderful book, uh, but uh, which is very, very good for psychiatrists, I think um, really gives you you know, the basics of what you need to know. It's, it's not like a PERVS uh, neuroscience, uh, which goes into much more detail, um, or you know, um, Hal Blumenfeld's uh, neuroanatomy through clinical cases, but it, this particular book um, I think is very good. Anyway, you can see this, this uh, lady here, she's taking the, uh, one of the CPT tests, and then on, on the right in this graph, uh, what you're seeing is uh, the uh, percent errors um, um, on standard CPT tests throughout the life, lifespan. So you can see that in, in early age, you know, there are relatively high percent of errors, which means that, uh, you know, a, a young uh, child's ability to attend and, and, and refrain from impulsively um, giving an answer is, is going to be less, right? They're, they're not as well developed. Their frontal lobe is not as well developed. In fact, their entire cortex is not as well developed. Um, and then as, as time goes on throughout the lifespan, um, you know, as you get older, you're going to have less and less errors because your, your frontal lobe is maturing. And then eventually, once you get to about 60 years old, then your ability to attend um, on these tasks uh, decrease. So I think this is just a cool diagram showing you um, throughout the lifespan kind of what, what happens. And this very much correlates with, um, you know, what's happening uh, neuroanatomically and, and neurodevelopmentally in terms of how the frontal lobes are maturing. Uh, and um, so anyway, I just, I thought that that was a cool slide. Okay, so working memory. So working memory uh, describes what is actively being considered at any given moment. Uh, working memory is temporary and it's limited in, in capacity. And then, you know, working memory and, and attention are closely related and interdependent. Um, the relationship between working memory and attention is incompletely understood, but may share similar uh, neurobiological mechanisms, uh, which are kind of slowly over time uh, uh, being elucidated. But I think, you know, it, we're still trying to understand this this relationship. If they're if, if they're the same thing, are they different? Um, certainly, uh, there's a lot of overlap. Um, and working memory and attention are important com uh, components of executive functioning. And executive functioning or executive function. Uh, includes working memory, attention, and other higher level cognitive skills such as organizing uh, priorities and planning. So trauma to the prefrontal cortex impairs working memory. I mean, that should, I mean, that, that, that makes sense, right? If we're saying that, you know, parts of the prefrontal cortex are very important for uh, working memory and they're also very important in the tasks that we just, uh, in, in the tasks like the sustained attention and the Stroop tasks, but I showed you earlier that it makes sense that if you have trauma to the prefrontal cortex, you're going to have impairment in, in your in your uh, working memory. But uh, this was best, you know, this was really illustrated or best illustrated by um, the famous case of Phineas Gage, who was a, a railroad worker who had a tampering iron uh, explode through his frontal cortex. He didn't die, um, but he went from being this very responsible and organized person to being very impulsive and attentive. And so this is, uh, this is just a picture of him that I got from the internet, but uh, it's a very important case because this was the beginning of, of really understanding what the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex 
what, what does it do? What is it, what is it, what's important about it? I mean, we knew, you know, from animal studies, but in humans, you can't just go around uh, taking people's, uh, you know, traumatizing people's frontal cortex and seeing what happens. I mean, that's unethical. But this, uh, this particular guy, uh, Phineas Gage, really helped, um, you know, neuroscientists and, and, and clinicians later on understand what, what are some of the important aspects of the prefrontal cortex. So in the 1970s, uh, neuroscientists began uh, measuring working memory in monkeys. So they implanted microelectrodes, they actually would implant these microelectrodes into individual neurons in the prefrontal cortex. And then they measured activity in these neurons while monkeys were performing what we call a delayed response task. Okay, so this is an example of the delayed response task um, with the monkey as our subject. So, um, you know, this monkey is, is, um, is shown uh, these two wells in front of it and a fruit is placed in one of them. And so the screen obviously is raised and the monkey observes a piece of fruit that's placed in one of the wells. Um, and then the screen is lowered and the wells are covered. And then after a specific period of time, uh, the screen is raised and the monkey has one chance to remember the correct location of the fruit. So you can see that this is basically um, a, a working memory task. So what they found um, when they did these studies, when they did these delayed response task studies, was that individual neurons responded differently during the delayed response task. So some neurons uh, were active only during the cue response part of the task, while other neurons responded only during the delay period. So, um, you know, the delayed neurons start firing with the presentation of the cue uh, and stop with the response. Um, these delayed neurons seem to hold the memory of the task. So literally the neural equivalent of working memory, um, although it's more likely, a, uh, more likely a network of neurons, but when the monkeys incorrectly responded, the delay neurons were usually inactive. So if the monkeys were distracted during the delay period, uh, the delay neurons were less active and the monkeys were found to make incorrect responses or, or did not respond at all. And so after the studies, uh, the researchers sacrificed the monkeys and identified the location of the, the microelectrodes. And it turned out that the Q neurons and delay neurons, um, which I'll show you in a moment, were in, diff were in different regions and, and, and sort of clustered in different areas. And um, I'll show you here, so that's just a picture of uh, the microelectrodes in the prefrontal cortex of the monkey while they're doing the task. Um, and you'll see here that there's, um, uh, you know, they were testing the, the neural activity in these different types of neurons. And um, then they, when they sacrificed the monkey, they, they looked at where these microelectrodes were and they were able to identify these neurons and where they are. And you can, you can see here that um, the delay neurons are, are more common than the Q neurons, um, showing the importance of holding a thought and working memory. Um, also, uh, it appears that the delay neurons cluster together in what we imagine is part of the network of working memory. And that's what you can see here. So there's clusters. So we can't talk about working memory without talking about uh, two catecholamines, which are dopamine and norepinephrine. And uh, what you see here is a rat with microelectrodes uh, in its brain. And essentially, this is the radial maze that it's often used in, in neuroscience research. And basically, what, what, this, what this apparatus is, um, there, you know, there's this mouse or this rat or mouse, and uh, there's different uh, treats at different arms of the maze. And the rat or the mouse is allowed to sort of explore and find out where those treats are. They learn the maze. And then the, the rat or the mouse is then sequestered in this area here and not allowed to see where all the, uh, where all the treats are. And then over a period of time, um, you know, they, they raise the, uh, the walls and then the rat then goes and tries to find where uh, the treats were. And so, um, so basically rat studies uh, using the radial maze uh, demonstrated an inverse correlation between the extracellular dopamine concentration, DA's dopamine, uh, in the prefrontal cortex and the number of errors during the task. So, you know, as, um, 
you know, there was a, there was a sort of a reciprocal inverse uh, correlation between how much dopamine there was in the prefrontal cortex and the number of errors, such that um, when the uh, when the amount of dopamine was higher, uh, they made less errors. Essentially, so that's just showing you that dopamine probably has a very important role in in, in working memory. And then the length of the delay period was also inversely correlated with the extracellular dopamine concentration in the prefrontal cortex and the number of errors. So as the length of the delay period increased, um, the extracellular dopamine concentration, um, uh, um, as the length increased uh, for the delay period, um, the extracellular concentration of dopamine was decreasing. And so um, you can see here that that uh, is illustrated by this uh, graph here. And this is important because um, there's implications for vagal nerve stimulation in ADHD. We know that the uh, you know, vagus nerve stimulation activates the locus ceruleus, which is a, 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 a nucleus uh, within the brainstem where norepinephrine neurons primarily have their uh, cell bodies located. And when you activate the locus ceruleus in the brainstem, it causes widespread release of norepinephrine throughout the cortex. And so if we can, if we can uh, pair that vagus nerve stimulation with some type of behavior, we could potentially promote attention to that behavior and, and cause the brain to change. And so uh, the vagal nerve stimulation uh, is in clinical trials currently for post-stroke uh, rehabilitation and tinnitus and maybe a future treatment for ADHD, which is, uh, which is just fascinating. Not to mention that the, uh, many of the medications we use in patients who have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder uh, involve um, you know, uh, stimulating or, or enhancing dopaminergic and noradrenergic tone um, in, in particular regions of the brain. So when it comes to reward and impulse control, it's important that we discuss this briefly because it has implications for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which uh, impulsivity is an is a important component um, of uh, the disorder. And um, controlling the impulse to take an immediate smaller reward rather than waiting for the larger delayed reward is essential for completing any project, right? I mean, you're, you're sitting there and you're trying to figure out, well, do I finish what I'm doing now or do I go to the party that's right down the street? Well, you know, it, it requires, um, you know, the impulsive person to be like, screw it, I'm out of here. I'm going to that party. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to go. Um, and the sort of more controlled person would say, well, I need to finish this first. And then once I'm done with this, then I can go to the party and enjoy myself. Um, and people who cannot control these impulses um, or, or who take the immediate reward first are perpetually falling behind. So an interesting study was done in the 1970s by a Stanford psychologist that I think was really um, was very interesting and and you know sort of illustrates uh, the, you know how reward and impulse control in kids can can potentially later on have negative influence or negative consequences. So uh, basically, in the Stanford Marshmallow experiment, they they took four-year-old kids and they sequestered them in a room. And they gave each of the kids one marshmallow. And they were told that, okay, well, you can either eat the marshmallow now, or you can wait until um, the research assistant who was in the room left to run an errand and, come, and came back, and then you could receive two marshmallows if you waited. So, you know, we'll give you this one now. And when the research assistant leaves and comes back, which you didn't know how long that would be, uh, if you waited, then you would get two marshmallows. And what was interesting is that the children um, had varying degrees of restraint. And so some children were like, screw it, I'm, I'm eating this now because I don't know when the, this person's coming back and I'm, I'm having this marshmallow right now. And then there was, you know, that was one end of the spectrum. And on the very other end of the spectrum were the, were the kids who just waited uh, for that, for, for the second marshmallow. Um, so what they did is they, 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 they determined who were the sort of impulsive eaters and the patient waiters, and then they, they followed these kids over time into adolescence and adulthood, and they found that the children who were better at inhibiting the impulse to, to immediately eat that one marshmallow were in general more resilient, confident, and dependable as adolescents, and were successful, more successful students and scored higher on the SAT score. And you can see the average uh, SAT scores there. Um, 
between the impulsive eaters and the patient waiters. Now, you could argue that SAT doesn't really measure anything. Well, if it, it, it probably doesn't, but what it does do a good job probably at measuring is uh, in, in, you know, sustained attention, a, a person's ability to sort of sit there and, and uh, for long periods of time and, and do mundane, boring tasks. Um, and so I thought that that was just an interesting study, and the study uh, is right here at the very bottom if you want to look at that yourself. So the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to reward and impulse control are some of the brain regions, not all of them, right, not all of the brain regions, but just some of the brain regions uh, that are um, involved in reward and impulse control. Uh, first one, uh, you know, the nucleus accumbens, the nucleus accumbens is um, a, a structure which is located um, in the ventral striatum, uh, the striatum being the caudate and putamen, which is sort of this uh, earpiece Bluetooth set looking structure there on both sides of the brain. Uh, we know that attention and impulsivity, impulsivity are partially controlled by dopamine within the nucleus accumbens. Uh, we know that people are less distracted when pursuing activities they enjoy. Um, stimulant medications increase dopamine at the nucleus accumbens and improve uh, impulse control. And uh, rats, interestingly, uh, when their nucleus accumbens are damaged, become more impulsive and they immediately choose the immediate reward instead of waiting. So the nucleus accumbens is very important. Uh, unfortunately, also the nucleus accumbens is important in uh, addictive behaviors and, and um, an addiction. And most of the drugs of abuse, um, you know, affect uh, dopamine uh, neurotransmission uh, within the nucleus accumbens. And so uh, this is partly why uh, individuals um, who uh, use various drugs of abuse um, they develop sort of the positive reinforcing effects um, because of the uh, dopamine that's released um, within the nucleus accumbens. And that's, I mean, that's a partial explanation. It's much more complicated than that, but um, that's sort of the simplified version. The striatal dopamine transporter density, uh, what the hell is that? Well, the, the dopamine transporter sits at the very uh, end of, of the neuron at the terminal region and what the dopamine transporter does is it, uh, it sucks up dopamine after it's released by the neurons. So in other words, when, when dopamine is released into the synapse, um, the, the dopamine's got to go somewhere after it's sort of bound to its receptor and do, you know, done its uh, job. It's got to go somewhere, right? And so it's either degraded by enzymes, it's uh, either uh, degraded by enzymes or it's diffused away from, uh, diffuses away from the synapse, or it's uh, you know, sucked back into the neuron um, by the dopamine transporter. And um, high dopamine transporter density um, is seen in younger individuals and patients with ADHD, and higher straddle dopamine uh, transporter density has been correlated with more impulsive behavior. Uh, exactly why that is, they, you know, they're still trying to figure that out, um, but drug-naive patients with ADHD have a slightly higher density in dopamine transporters. So this is just an interesting graph um, uh, looking at dopamine transporter density in healthy humans uh, without ADHD uh, and looking at over the lifespan sort of what happens with the dopamine transporter density in the striatum. And you can see that over time as, as people get older, their uh, dopamine transporter density decreases. So dysfunctions in the, um, when it comes to ADHD, uh, neurobiology and, and, and neuro, uh, neuroscience, uh, dysfunctions in the prefrontal cortex and stratum um, are the most common abnormal brain findings that have been reported uh, for patients uh, who have ADHD. And Judith Rappaport um, did a number of neuroimaging studies and um, I'm going to talk about, sort of uh, summarize for you what these studies um, showed. So they have conducted several large prospective uh, case control uh, MRI studies of the brains of children with ADHD. And one study produced multiple MRI scans of 150 children with ADHD and 139 age and sex max uh, controls. 60% of the participants had at least two scans. 
So the most interesting finding was that children with ADHD had smaller total brain volumes by approximately 5% compared with controls. Uh, the difference held true for all four cerebral lobes, um, including the white and the gray matter, as well as the cerebellum. And the trajectory of the total brain volumes did not change as the children aged, nor was it affected by the use of stimulant medication. So in a follow-up study, uh, Rappaport's group examined another 300 subjects, half of whom had ADHD, and then they measured uh, regional gray matter thickness. And the most unique feature of this second study was that uh, they followed up the clinical outcome as well as the structural changes in the brain of the children over time. And they were able to compare the children who grew out of the disorder with those who did not. And the results showed that children with ADHD had global thinning of all of the gray matter compared uh, with controls, although it was most prominent in the prefrontal cortex. Um, both groups showed uh, the usual pruning of total gray matter as they uh, grew through adolescence. However, uh, two regions were unique when correlated with clinical outcome. The children who remained impaired at follow-up had thinner gray matter in the medial prefrontal cortex at the beginning of the study, um, and children who grew out of the disorder showed a normalization of the gray matter thickness in the right parietal cortex. So these results imply that the normalization of the parietal cortex may be a compensatory mechanism involving recruitment of parietal attention networks. And uh, parietal cortex, uh, therefore, may play a larger role in attention than previously considered. And I think this is important because when we think of uh, attention nowadays, we really focus not just on the prefrontal cortex, we really focus on the parietal cortex, uh, you know, and, and the parietal lobe, uh, especially when it comes to um, disorders uh, where patients have, you know, right um, hemispheric strokes involving the parietal lobe, they often have uh, what we call hemi neglect syndrome, which 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 is an attentive uh, problem uh, with the left visual field. They they can their 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 sensory processing is intact, but their ability to attend to the left to the left visual field um, is impaired. And so that's just something um, worth mentioning. So going along with um, you know the pre the uh, parietal cortex. Uh, playing a larger role in attention than we thought. Uh, this study um, compares, uh, you know, healthy subjects and patients who have ADHD or suffer from ADHD and looking at uh, regions of the brain that have more activation during a target detec detection task. And what you can see is that there are parts of the frontal and parietal lobes um, that are much more activated in healthy subjects than in, in ADHD patients during this, you know, a particular attention task. So this is uh, the end of the neurobiology of ADHD. Um, there's much more in the references. Um, you'll find much more reading uh, material if you're interested. This was a very general overview and by no means was it all inclusive. Uh, we just don't, I don't have time to go into all of the neuroanatomy and, and, and uh, neuro studies, but I think that um, if you are interested, I will make sure that in the references at the very, very end, um, that you can, you can you know, look through those references and, and read the studies if you're interested.